we will ask the following question have we actually chosen the right thing as our efficient allocation so i will this is the chapter on social choice theory And if you remember on the very first lecture, I drew you some graph saying that there is mechanism design and there are many, many, many different adjacent fields. So this is one of those adjacent fields. It is not strictly speaking a part of mechanism design, but it's so closely related that I decided to talk about this a little bit. And here the question is, given preferences, given some society, and some number of agents and some preferences of these agents so given preferences of society members mechanism members in our case what is the optimal social choice uh, the optimal socially optimal decision in particular before this point we just said that it is our case star the efficient allocation that again maximizes the sum of, of utilities but I remember that just as soon as I introduced this allocation case star, there was a question. Why does it make sense? Why it is the right one? The utilities don't make sense on their own. Utilities are just a construct. I can use utility for intrapersonal comparison. So, you know, I, I can have some utility function in my head. And I say, well, you know, Apple is five utils, orange is six utils. Uh, BM, BMW M3 is 5,000 utils, something like that. But if I value my Apple, oh no, oh no. if I value my Apple at 5 utils, and Johan values his Apple at 15 utils, does this mean that Johan values an Apple three times more than me? So what does it mean? How to measure the utility, the real utility, the happiness? And how to compare it across agents? And the answer is, well, you cannot. We kind of assumed that we can use some numerary good for that purpose, like money or some other kind of token. And that hinges on the assumption that the utility of money is the same for everybody. But that's obviously not true. There can be risk aversion. There can be just wealth effects. So it's not perfect either. But if we cannot rely on utilities for, for intrapersonal comparisons, how can we try to approach this question and find possibly some other alternative to case talk? And this is basically the question that social choice asks and sometimes says, that, well, what if we adopt this social choice rule or this game among agents, this kind of voting mechanism or this kind of um, bargaining scheme among agents, what will the social choice be in the end? And we'll kind of dip our toes very briefly into that for today, and I hope today only, and we'll see that nothing ever good comes out of it. As I said, we don't like the cardinal representation of payoffs, so meaning utilities, utility functions. What is the other way in which we can represent individual preferences apart from utility functions? Exactly, yes. Preference relations uh, are the other way to represent it. So, so we will use ordinal representation of preferences. And I am um, not really strict on labeling here. I wish I was. I will sometimes just call them preference. Preferences, I will sometimes call them preference relations. These will be 
exactly the relation of as good as something else. So here A referred by player I to B means exactly that. So player I perceives alternative A at least as good as option B. And there are a lot of you can talk a lot about these relations, about how they should look like, about what kind of axioms they should satisfy. And we will skip all that because I will assume that if you wanted to see some of that, you saw it in some micro course or choice theory course. And that is just too far from mechanism design to spend our time here on. Instead, what we will do is we will say, well, we have some society. We have some preferences in this society. And once again, the question is, given the collection of preference relations for all players i, so a collection for all players i from 1 to n, you can include designer, it doesn't matter. What is the socially optimal decision? And the second part you can frame, what is the optimal social choice function, f of theta? Or here, just which alternative, given some preferences, which alternative do we choose? More generally, you can ask, what is the social preference? So you can, can we construct a social preference relation? Saying that we as a society value this option about this option, about that option, and so on. So I will modify that question to ask what is the, not the social optimal decision, but the social preferences squiggle S. So I'll denote social preferences with this subscript S. In particular, for today, for this social choice part, I will not even be talking about the incentives whatsoever. I will not be asking how can we determine what these individual preferences are if we don't know them. For today, the question is purely about aggregation. So we will forget about types. We will just assume that these preferences are known and we are trying to construct this uh, social preference. Where do we start? So basically, to determine what, what constitutes a good aggregator, a good procedure for a constructed social preference, we want to establish some criteria that it will satisfy. Right? Before, our criteria was simple. The social optimal decision must maximize the sum of utilities. And that was our unique criteria. Now it's not as simple, but the spirit is the same. So what we can do is we can impose some axioms on the relations between the collection of individual preferences and the social preference in the end. So we will say, you know, if this particular thing happens in the individual preferences, then social preference should include, should be like that. So I call this the axiomatic approach, and everyone else does, does as well. So we can impose axioms on, on how a collection of individual preferences map into social preferences. Again, or a social choice function f. I will kind of work with both of them at the same time. What kind of axioms can we think about? So what, what are the requirements that uh, you can think of without looking at the slides? What constitutes a good preference? Uh, so to repeat the answer, uh, if the majority of the society prefers one option over another, it should be preferred by the society. But a counter-argument, can, can this be too strong? What if our majority are the oppressive white men 
and uh, they prefer something that harms the minorities. So, so it is a kind of a weaker version of the majority, saying that if everyone values something over another, then we as a society should definitely do the same thing. And uh, I will call this axiom two, unanimity. If all players I prefer A over B, then we as a society prefer A over B. Can we think of anything else? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is this would be an axiom, yeah, on the social pro choice preference itself, not on the mapping. Uh, and the, the axiom that was suggested is transitivity. So we are assuming that if A is better than B and B is better than C, then A would be better than C according to the social preference. And so this is correct. For, for today, as I said, as I promised, I will abstract completely from choice theory. So I assume that all of these are the proper preferences as you, uh, as you define them in choice theory. So they are complete, transitive, reflexive anything else but yes it's correct uh, we would want this final preference to first of all rank all the alternatives be transitive and uh, reflexivity is just a technical thing that something can be better than itself or everything is weakly better than itself all right awesome okay so we're we're, we're trying to find the good balance between majority and unanimity. So what if one, everybody except for one person prefers their A over B? But then the counter argument is, what if we have a society of just two people? Or just one? <laughs> good point. So, or what if we have a, a, a big society, but this one person is really, really well respected? And uh, did they deserve to, to, you know, deemed worthy of ruling the society, of deciding fates, and has the power given to him by God, something like that. Uh, but there is an axiom like that, I believe, in social choice theory, and it's called no veto power. And it says that if all agencies have for one prefer something, then maybe we should still do that. It is a good axiom. You can use that. We will not use that. Uh, any other suggestions? Cool. Uh, you, could, you could have not come up with the axioms that I have in mind, so it was just, you know, brainstorming ideas for, for what can be in, in, in other, what can you do in social choice in general. But the two other axioms that I will impose today, because I have this power given to me by the study administration, and I can decide which axioms we select. A1 will be the, I call it the domain assumption or full domain. And this axiom says that whatever individual preferences there are, we should be able to come up with a decision. We should be able to aggregate any profile of individual preferences. And those of you who have heard of social choice theory already know where I'm going with this. So any collection can be aggregated. into S. Into social preference. And the third axiom that I will introduce and then we'll take a break is called the independence of irrelevant alternatives. And this is a somewhat slightly mouthy one. So independence of Irrelevant alternatives. And this axiom says that the social preference between the two alternatives should be fully determined by the individual preferences between these two alternatives. But uh, 
preferences regarding other alternatives should not enter this decision. So it says that if this one collection and the other collection uh, of preferences with a prime, or was it rank, two alternatives A and B the same, then the resulting social choice preferences do the same. Then so do uh, squiggle S and squiggle S prime. All of these are kind of sensible, right? They, they do not strike as yes, too exotic or too strong and they are reasonable, they make sense. But they are enough for things to get out of hand completely, and we will see that after the break. So let's reconvene at 2.50. So, as I promised, we will witness the fall of classical economics. I remember when uh, I first saw this theorem in, in, in the course, the weather was kind of like this, except there, there was also rain pouring and thunder and lightning, so it was very fitting. <laughs> and many of you, I assume, have heard about this theorem, and many of you can probably even state it. Can you? Can anyone tell me what, how it goes, just based on what we have here? There is no such mechanism that can have all these characteristics at once. So first of all, we're not talking about mechanism, about aggregation, but um, there is such a such a mapping, but it has to be very peculiar. With with over three choices, it has to be very peculiar. Okay, refining further. It's always solved by dictator, and that is the correct answer. We have a correct answer on Zoom. Yes. So the theorem goes like that, with more. Um, I'll write it shorter. If we have at least three alternatives. So X is our outcome space. And I have not mentioned it, but we are kind of have the general model in mind. So we have some abstract set of outcomes. We no longer have utilities, but we have preferences and so on. So if we have at least three outcomes, then the aggregator satisfies the three axiom, axioms, if and only if it is dictatorial. Meaning, there exists a player in our society such that um, A is socially preferred to B if and only if this person says so. A is preferred by I to B. And so this says that whatever we do, even if we try to satisfy axioms that are as weak seemingly as those, we cannot really do any better than assign a dictator in our society. If we relax our requirements on the social preference itself, for example, yeah, if we allow it to be maybe non-fully transitive, uh, some quasi-transitive, or there was some other requirement that, that I already forgot, then you actually will still have anal analogs of error theorem, but a weaker analogs, respectively. So instead of dictatorial, you can have oligarchy, where some subset of agents will decide everything. I'm not exactly sure how they decide among themselves, which is what they choose, but there was a statement like that. And then there can be a collegiate, I, I have no idea what that means, but there can be some collegial social choice rules, if you relax it further. And at the end of the chain, if you relax transitivity all the way, uh, you will have still the statement that there will be some agent with veto power. So someone will always have the power to just block some kind of, any kind of social decision. But yeah, I'm, I'm not presenting those statements. It's just to say that, just to tell you that they are out there. The truth is out there. Now, the original proof of Arrow in his 1950 thesis, I, I, I never read it. I will not pretend that I did. From what I heard from multiple sources, it's 70 pages long. 
So that may or may not be true, but what is true is that it's absolutely impenetrable. It's unreadable at all. Fortunately, 70 years have passed, and people have been looking at this theorem enough to refine those proofs a little bit. So by now there is a wonderful paper by John Genicopoulos from 2005 called uh, Three Elegant Proofs of Arrow's the Theorem, and it's five pages long. I will not give you these uh, proofs in here, but you can uh, access the paper itself. As I said, it's just five pages. It's very readable, unlike Arrow's or, uh, thesis. So, uh, yeah. And, but the way, the logic that these proofs follow are kind of taking different profiles of individual preferences and then just changing them a little bit. So say we take this profile, okay, this is social preference. Now, what if we flip one player's preferences between two alternatives, what is the social choice then? And then if you do enough of these manipulations, you will arrive at some kind of contradiction, saying that you know, there, there cannot be anything else except for dictatorship. So, okay, how can we go about this? What can we do about this? And I will not even ask this question for you because it was already answered by Elizabeth during the break and everybody had a chance to hear it. Maybe some of our axioms are too strong. Like domain. Because if you think about it, it seems reasonable at first sight. We, you know, we should be able to um, map any profile of social preferences into something. But if you look at settings in which there are enough of these alternatives. And actually, I can't remember if Arrow's theorem generalizes to infinite number of alternatives. I guess it does. Uh, yeah, but if you consider enough alternatives, such as access to money, transfers, which we usually treat as a continuous variable, you can choose any number. This domain says that some players can have very weird preferences and non monotone with respect to money. They can like to receive five dollars better than uh, better than ten dollars, but less than seven dollars. So some kind of these weird non-monotonicities. You know, the question is, do we want to allow such preferences in our world? And it turns out that if we relax the domain, if we look at the restricted domain, we can get a lot more mileage from our social choice theory social choice theory in particular. Uh, we will look at, how, how would I call this? I don't want to call this single picked worlds, but worlds with single picked preferences. So I will put this as a subtitle for a not very long discussion. Single pick preferences. In particular, we can assume that all alternatives are ordered along some axis. This is obviously not always the case. There are some problems where you cannot just order the alternatives. Like, what is better, uh, eating babies or um, uh, what, what else is bad? Uh, cloning Hitlers. <laughs> which is better than that? What is the axis along which you can align those? You can't. But in some problems you can. For example, if we as a society choose a tax rate on which to tax corporations, or if we choose how much do we want to spend on the next Olympics that will be organized in our city, something like that. So assume that uh, alternatives X are ordered. So our large X um, is X composed by X1, which is smaller than X2, smaller than X3, and so on, smaller than the largest alternative X had some letter for that x is m yes i just wanted to check exactly we don't know you have some order some notion of being smaller 
So you have some dimension along which you can order these alternatives. Yes, absolutely, yes. So this is some commonly shared order. All agents in the society agree that alternative one is smaller than this, smaller than this, and so on. Right. And we want to assume that uh, preferences are single picked with respect to that order. So squiggle i is single picked if there exists some x star to the peak such that um, if we compare two alternatives smaller than x star, then the largest alternative is preferred. So xl is preferred by player i to xk, while if we compare two alternatives on the other side of the peak, then the ranking is reversed. So the idea is that the player prefers the alternative closest to the peak if we compare two alternatives on the one side. But it does not say about comparing anything about comparing alternatives on different sides of the peak. And so if we restrict our domain assumption to single peak preferences, if we say that we only need to be able to aggregate um, in situations when all agents have single peak preferences, then we can have a social choice rule that is non-dictatorial. We will obviously have the dictatorial still, because it is a subset of the, our general setting. But we will have other social choice rules, other aggregators of social preferences that satisfy the axioms. And one of them was already kind of mentioned today. And I do not know what's the name of this theorem. We came up with it. I'll just attribute it to the textbook where I found it. M. Maskell, Winston Green. And these are two propositions in one. It says that in the general setting, so the same setting that we considered here. I should have put that qualifier in the arrows theorem as well. In the general setting, with single peak preferences, odd number of players n, we have a mechanism that's called pairwise majority voting. That works just fine for our purposes. I have not defined it anywhere, but I hope that the name is pretty much self-explanatory. So under this uh, choice principle, preference aggregator, we just ask all players to vote among every pair of alternatives. So we ask everybody, is A is better than B? If the majority says that A is better, then we say that we as a society will prefer A. So this is exactly the majority rule. And what we can say is that in this, given these assumptions, this way to construct social preferences will be good enough. So on the one hand, it generates a well-defined social preference. And here I have not defined well-defined well -defined either, which is kind of ironic. But what I mean here is that this is a proper preference relation. So again, complete, transitive, reflexive, and whatever else I, I forgot. So it generates a good preference, which is good. Uh, which And this preference satisfies the three axioms. A1, A3, and this social result, this resulting social preference always has at the top the peak of the median player. So the median of all the peaks in society, meaning that this majority voting is good for our definition of good. To just draw a simple graph, show how it works. So assume that our axes, our alternatives are aligned along this, this axis. And we're working with preferences, but as you know, any preference relation admits a utility representation. So 
let's look at some utility functions coherent with uh, preferences. Single bit means that these utility functions will be single bit or quasi MP. So we'll have player i something like this, player two preferring something like that. This is not, is not increasing, this cannot be increasing. Player three prefers something like that. And these are all three players. So they have respective peaks, x star one, x star two, x star three. And so as a society, we will always select this middle peak. Because we know that if we compare it with any alternative, say to the left of it, then at least half of the people, so everyone to the with the peak to the right plus the median guy will prefer this alternative to anything to the left, and vice versa. So we will always have a majority voting for this alternative against anything else. But the takeaway here is that once we restrict the domain assumption, while we restrict the domain of preferences that we need to aggregate, Arrow's theorem kind of loses its power, and we can come up with some social choice rules that are okay-ish, or some definitions of okay. Uh, so without without single pickiness, we can have what is called a Condorcet paradox. So to, to tell you why um, why we need it. So if we have three alternatives, player one prefers A to B to C, player two strictly prefers B to C to A, player three prefers C to A to B. Then these preferences are not single bit. There is no common order among all players. And if we try to apply the pairwise majority voting, we will see that A is better than B, because two out of the three people agree. B is better than C, because one and two agree. C is better than A, because players two and three agree. But then A, A is better than B, better than C, better than A, better than B, better than C. We enter a loop. So the preferences are not transitive. And uh, that's the issue that single bigness solves. Whew. So the bottom, the bottom line of our venture into I raised the title, social choice theory, is that social choice is hard. And you can have some social choice rules which satisfy some arbitrary axioms that I also erased, but it's generally kind of a difficult question. What should we do as a society given preferences of its individual members? So there is a whole field devoted to that. And in this course, we just ran away from this issue, saying that instead of trying to figure out what is the right thing to do, we will just adopt one rule, say that it is the right thing to do, and we'll try to implement that. But in general, if you do not agree, you can use all of the other uh, plenty of rules, and you can try to implement them. 